Welcome back to another episode of That's Business. Today's guest, Michelle Gilbert, is Chief Engine Officer of Purple Engine Coaching and Consulting, a company she started after an illustrious 34-year career in public relations and corporate communications. As a certified coach, Michelle empowers young professionals and emerging leaders to navigate business challenges with confidence and influence so they can thrive and achieve their professional aspirations. Michelle, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for joining. Have you always been someone that you knew you wanted to be in leadership or what did you want to be when you air quote, you were growing up, so to say? I would say when I was growing up, I had no idea what leadership was. I certainly did not have the confidence to think that I could be a leader. When I was growing up, you're going to laugh at this, but I wanted to be a marine biologist. And what's ironic about that is, one, I was never really great at science (laughs) as a kid, which is something you need. And second, I hate swimming in an ocean. So it was, oh, (laughs) yeah, I'm just freaked out by what's under me that I can't see. So thankfully, I did not go that route because I don't think I would have been very good at it. (laughs) Hey, I had a friend who wanted to be a doctor, afraid of needles. So I get it. She changed her career path, engineer now. But yes, that same sound. It sounds good, but. (laughs) Yep. So funny. Okay. So when did we decide that the marine biologist route was not for you? And what did we decide to do after that? Yeah, I don't know exactly when I figured that piece out. You know, it was like one of those dreams, like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a movie star. And you kind of just grow out of it. But I was really, really interested in sports growing up. I have this picture of me sitting on my dad's lap when I was about four years old watching a baseball game. I was the kid who went, you know, spent my birthday at Tiger Stadium, just soaking it all in. So when I went to college, and I was really fortunate that I had a teacher in high school who really believed in me and taught me how to write. And so when I went to college, I chose my major of journalism only because I didn't have to take any math classes in college. And I was horrible at math along with the science. So that's how I chose my major. And I kind of just fell into public relations. I thought I wanted to go into sports journalism and be a broadcaster. And I kind of realized that you have to move around and start off in small markets. And you also have to have an appreciation for all sports, not just basketball and baseball, which is what I grew up kind of knowing and learning. So I, I figured out in college that I probably wasn't going to be the best broadcast sports journalist for similar reasons why marine biology wasn't my thing. And I remember I I actually had a radio broadcast class and the professor asked me if I was interested in applying for an internship with the Michigan Department of Agriculture's Press and Public Affairs Department. And being, you know, a naive, arrogant, college student, I said, no, thank you. I know nothing about farming. Like, oh, dumb was that. Thankfully, he didn't settle for that answer. And he really encouraged me. And that is how I learned about what PR was. And I never changed my major. I stuck with journalism, which I'm grateful I did because it really taught me the meaning of a deadline and how to build a story that is interesting for your audience, not just for you. But I went the PR route and I learned how to write a press release long before I had a PR class. And that's what got my grade point up, because it certainly wasn't from the economics classes that I took at Michigan State. (laughs) Mm -mm. Can relate. What did I get? I think I failed my econ class like I was only senior with all freshmen. But I use the concepts today. It was just very test heavy and I'm not going to take a test. So I still talk to that professor funny enough. So can relate to say the least. That's so interesting. So you actually had work experience first before Mm -hmm. even having to go through those classes. Yeah. Not to go on a tangent, but I always am curious as young people are exposed to different careers early on, how much of a difference that would make because say that professor did not push you and life could have been completely different. So that's so fascinating to look at. So 
we go through college, we graduate. What did you end up doing post-college or getting into? Because with that journalism degree, you could go a lot of different routes there. Yeah. So here's the irony of it all. So when I was in college, once I figured out I wanted to do PR, I was the queen of internships. I had so many different internships, government, nonprofit, agency. I did it all. I also did freelance writing. And by the way, I was really lucky. I got paid at every single internship. I graduate college and nobody wants to offer me a job. (laughs) And this goes to the power of networking. I was on my way to a Detroit Pistons game with my dad and we went to dinner and he runs into a friend of his, introduces me and says, My daughter, Michelle, just graduated. She's looking for a job in public relations. And this guy says, oh, my friend owns his own agency. Use my name and maybe he'll give you an interview. And that's how I got my foot in the door at Mark's Lane and Company. And they offered me an unpaid internship. And I was like, well, wait a minute. As a student, I was paid for my internships. Right, exactly. But I took it because... I thought at least it's a foot in the door. I proved myself pretty quickly and became an account assistant and moved my way up from there. I became the agency's first female vice president. And I loved, loved what I did. And I tell young professionals and college students all the time, it is okay to accept help from your parents and your parents' friends. They are not getting you the job. They are getting you a foot in the door. And you know this better than anyone, Angela. The way the hiring process is now, you have to be able to rely on who you know. So my career kind of took off from there. And I will also tell you that I never got a job from blindly applying. I got my jobs because of people who I knew and the relationship I established and the work that I did. And I loved my career. I absolutely loved spending 34 years in PR and corporate communications. And bringing up the point of your parents aren't getting you the job because I have friends now that are like, well, I don't want you to help me. I want to do it on my own or I don't want to do it this way. And I'm like, no, like you just have to. That's something that has not changed about the job market at all is if you can get a referral in. I mean, I'm trying not to go on a soapbox about this, but yes, network and tell people what you're looking for because it makes all the world of a difference. I think it's okay to go on a soapbox because the more you say it, the more people are going to pay attention. Yes, it's true. And it has nothing to do with you're not good enough or your skills aren't good enough. It's just like you got to play the game. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. So we have a badass 34 year career. What made you start your own company and really picking the group of young professionals to work with because sure that's a big difference. You work corporate communications, you could go the executive route. You could make probably a lot more money working with higher level individuals there. But what made you pick young professionals? So I am going to tell a story that I haven't publicly shared <gasps> um, in terms of <laughs> We love a good story. In terms of how I made that switch, um, I wasn't planning on it. I worked for Comcast and they went through a restructuring of my department and my job was eliminated. And so I had a choice to make, either take a severance and figure out what my next chapter was or apply for another job within the company. And by the way, some of the other jobs I could have applied for would have been promotions. And all I can tell you, Angela, is that every bone in my body told me it was time to finally jump off the diving board and take a chance on me. And I was already in a program to earn my coaching certification. And my plan was to build it into my existing career and coach people within my company And then in a couple of years, when my youngest daughter graduates from high school, I planned to hang up those corporate cleats and give myself a little bit more flexibility. So I fast-tracked my plans just because my gut told me to. And I don't think I would have had the courage to do that 
in any other part of my career because I think I felt like my family relies on me for insurance. My family relies on me to put food on the table. But when you've spent 34 years working and saving and being responsible, benefits come with that. And yes, I'm still responsible for my family's insurance. Um, and it hurts to pay that premium. Oh, yeah. But my kids are older now, so they won't rely on me financially for much longer, hopefully. <laughs> not going not gonna what? <laughs> if they're listening, that's a message to them. But that's how I got to where I am today. I don't want to say I was forced into the decision because there was no forcing, but I, I had to make a choice that I wasn't expecting to make. And I loved working at Comcast. The people are wonderful. I had an amazing, brilliant boss. I told her I would have followed her around the sun and our time was cut short. But you know what? Life happens. And being able to trust your instincts and make decisions that you think are best for you, you know, there's no one right path. And I'm sure if I had chosen the other path, I would have been okay too. But I love what I'm doing. And to answer your second question, why young professionals? I think throughout my entire career, other than maybe the first couple of years, I've always mentored people who are a little bit behind where I'm at and helping guide them through their journey. And I did that with every company I worked at. I even taught a presentation training class for a decade at Comcast. And to me, it is so gratifying to watch their growth and to be able to see them build their confidence and help them understand what they're capable of. And when I look around the coaching industry, so many people say, I coach executives, VPs, this and that. And it's not that I wouldn't coach VPs. I have coached VPs and I, I have clients who are at that level, but the young professionals need support, maybe even more, dare I say. And I've walked in their shoes. I've been that insecure young professional or college student. I see trends with them. They're afraid to make mistakes because they think that's going to cost them their job. They are afraid to ask for guidance because they assume that they are supposed to know the answers. And so having someone who has been there and done that help them figure out, no, that's okay. Here's how to ask for guidance. You know, here's what you do when you make a mistake so that you don't make the same mistake. And being able to kind of watch them grow through that process to me is one of the greatest gifts. It is. And it's interesting, too. And I've said this of I can't imagine growing up or like going through social media was like just becoming a thing because I'm a millennial. So I'm in that sandwich generation of I lived without tech and I saw the whole digital age growing up, which was super interesting. It's just a whole different world. And I can't imagine growing up or going through high school even with how popular social media is and just that confidence we lack already, let alone having everything at your fingertips and then being like, oh my God, am I far enough along? What am I doing? And all the doomsday questions we tend to ask ourselves. So I want your take on this. Of course, different generations say, oh, well, this generation has it easy. And, uh, you know, they sit at home and work and make a lot of money. You know, they don't have the grunt work I did. So what would you say to those individuals of different generations that have that mentality about younger generations? Hmm. Uh, I would say sit down and have a cup of coffee with someone from a younger generation and get to know what they're really thinking. I've worked with a lot of people in the millennial generation and Gen Z. I'm Gen X. And I think one of the first things I said to you is because we when we met, we hit it off so well. And I said, oh, my gosh, we have so much in common. And by the way, I could be your mom. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many friends actually older than my parents, which is even funnier because I don't realize it till they're like, oh, my kid, my 30 something year old. And I'm like, oh, I guess you could be my parent, you know, thinking like that. But well, I don't want to know how old your parents are. I don't ever feel that way, though. That's the difference is, you know, I love doing this podcast. I love doing all these different things and owning a business because you get to meet cool people like yourself. 
age is probably the least important thing in this arena because I just had someone on the podcast. She's 21 or 22 years old, started her business at 18 while she was in college. Like incredible. And I learned so much. That is so inspiring. Yeah, it just I love that because it is true. It's true. But it's something I feel like we learn from each other and we actually like sit down and have have that literal cup of coffee that we did. Yeah. And you just learn so much. And I think that's something. Yeah. Different generations are. It's like, oh, well, this generation hates me. Well, you're saying I'm this. And it's just like, well, how do we get here? Like, can't we just all chat? So. Yeah. I mean, I think generalizations can be very dangerous. Not everyone in Gen Z is afraid of this or afraid of that. Yes, there are trends. And one of the things that I talk to that generation about when I'm privileged enough to sit down with them is social media and the phones have changed the way they communicate. And it's not their fault. It's just a fact of life. There was a study that was done that shows that a lot of, not all, because I'm not generalizing, but a lot of the Gen Zers who are graduating from college are not able to secure a job because they're not, they don't know how to sell themselves. They don't know how to talk to a stranger with confidence. So they're not showing up in that interview, engaging and ready to hit it out of the ballpark. So someone's got to teach them, right? So that's what I want to do. I want to help them figure out How do you do that interview so that you become unforgettable so that they're like, I can teach them these skills and these nuances, but I want someone who's driven and has a personality and who knows what they stand for. And I think that Gen Z knows all that. And I'm picking on Gen Z right now. They just need a little bit of guidance in figuring out how to do it, how to come out of their shell. And it does make a difference, I feel, to where I come from entrepreneurs And my God, my brother and I were trained from a very young age, like anywhere we go. We were in literal Italy at the Trevi Fountain and saw someone we knew from Clinton Township. Like, oh, my God, the world, I cannot tell you, is so small, but our family and now that's kind of passed on to me of like, we know so many people that my brother and I were still very much our can make friends with the wall is our big joke. But it makes a difference. And if you have more introverted parents or if you had to do school virtual, I mean, Mm -hmm. I can't imagine going to college entirely virtual. I had a few online classes, but it makes the world of a difference. And funny enough, the best thing my mother did for me, which I was not thrilled at the time, but my aunt had breast cancer at the time. And she was like, all right, we're going to do this golf outing because you want to raise money. Do this Susan G. Komen walk. Great. I'll plan it. You and your friends have to go get all of the donations for it. So she dropped us off at a Partridge Creek or no, we drove, we drove because we were 16. So we drove to Partridge Creek. She gave us a list and was like, here's your pitch. Let's practice and let's do it. And she made us at 16, 17 years old, walk into every business, get donations. And we killed it. It was great. But I like think back to that of how good that was of training of like, I was mad at her at the time, but, you know, doing those small little events or like building up that confidence and skill, I feel like makes such a difference or, you know, who you surround yourself with and not everyone, especially Gen Z has the opportunity to feel confident to start your own business or take that leap or do the thing. I mean, I talk to people all the time, especially Gen Z. That's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, listen, I was 24 when I started my business and I was a child, but it works out and you figure it out. Age should not matter for a job, for you starting a business. It's all about who the individual person is. Can you be extroverted and do business development? Can you start your own business at different walks of life? So that's a great story about what your mom did. Isn't it amazing how we can look back and identify those moments that we hated as young adults or kids that come back to like, oh, there was real meaning behind that. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So obviously every client's different for who you work with. And that's something we bonded over, of course, of not just doing a one size fits all for every client. Right. So how do you approach without giving away the secret sauce, working with the clients (laughs) that you do and how you're a little different from other coaches in the market? Sure. And I don't even think there's any secret sauce. I'm I'm kind of an open book. Well, I think what makes me different is that 
I've got the communications expertise. I know how to tell a story. I know how to build a message that's going to resonate with an audience. So I've got all that communications expertise, but I also understand how to thrive, not survive, but thrive in the business world. So when I blend those together with my ability to form strong relationships, more than anything else, I consider myself a relationship builder. People like to do business with people who they like. And I hate the phrase, I'm a people person. The big joke in PR is when you say, so why do you want to do PR? Because I'm a people person. (laughs) It's like, you can work in a restaurant and be a people person. So I'm now making fun of myself because I called myself a people person. But I really, truly enjoy meeting people and getting to know people and helping people. And so when I combine that all together, I think the reason people are drawn to me is because they know that I've got their back. They know that they can trust me and that I truly, truly care about them the way I would care about my best friend or my daughters. I take what I do very, very seriously. And not everyone's going to be drawn to me, but for those who are, I pour my heart and soul into supporting them. And everyone, it isn't a one size fits all. And I think that for me has been so interesting as I, you know, newer in this industry officially, but what I've been doing, I've been doing my entire career is the mentoring and the coaching and the helping. And, you know, you have to be able to listen and figure out not just what someone is saying, but what they're not saying and asking them those probing questions and drawing attention to the assumptions they're making, the limiting beliefs they have. And it's funny because when I was going through the coaching program and I started learning some of this stuff that I didn't really understand what the name was for it, I started even seeing it in my own kids. And sometimes I'll even ask them, well, how do you know that to be true? And they look at me and they're like, well, I guess I don't really know if it's true. (laughs) Right. Did I answer your question? Yes. I love when people ask me that because I'm like, I don't know what I asked you. The ADHD (laughs) just spews out questions as they come up. I don't know what I asked you. So sounds great to me. Yeah. (laughs) So if you're listening to this and you don't know, I don't come up with questions for this podcast. We just vibe and figure it out. So little behind the scenes take. So I laugh when people ask me, did I answer that? Because in my head I say, yeah, but I don't remember what I asked you. So sounds good to me. Now, what are some easy, maybe like your top three tips for young professionals of if they're just deer in the headlights? Because I remember when I graduated, it was like a few months down the road coming home crying. And I'm like, is this what it's like to be an adult? Because I don't want it. And, you know, you're Mm -hmm. promised this fat job with the great money and everything you want. And, you know, you just have to show up because you have that degree and you have that checklist and they'll love you and pay you what you want, which is not at all true. So what are some tips that you know, recent graduates or young professionals can take advantage of to start on their path to where they want to be? So a couple tips that come to mind. First of all, if you graduate and you don't have a job waiting for you, which by the way, you are not alone. Most people don't. Nope. There is nothing wrong with taking an internship post-graduation, especially if it's paid. Because I don't care whether you call yourself an intern, a consultant, a freelancer, an assistant, whatever. You are working in the industry that you want and you're getting paid experience. And I think a lot of companies, especially I see this with PR agencies, it becomes almost a let's try each other on for size because offering a three to six month internship gives not just the company, an opportunity to see if you're a good fit, but it's great for you as the graduate to figure out, is this the culture I want? Because it's a heck of a lot better to say, oh, I finished that three-month internship. Thank God it's over because I couldn't stand that company versus, ugh, I'm stuck because I've been told I have to give that first job a full year 
Otherwise, it's going to look bad on my resume. So there's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of times, if it is a good fit for both sides, they do end up hiring you. So that would be tip number one. Don't let your ego get in the way of taking a great opportunity. Um, Network. And when I talk about networking, it's not just about going on LinkedIn and asking for what you want from everybody that you haven't talked to in seven years. You have to nurture those relationships. And I have been preaching this to my daughter, who will be 21 on Tuesday. You have to find those inherent opportunities to reach out to those professors, those bosses that you had at your internships and let them know what's going on. Because two or three years down the road, when you need something from them, you don't want them to be like, well, she hasn't kept in touch with me. I have college students who engage with me all the time on LinkedIn and they are so good at it. And I am so incredibly impressed because when they graduate and I hear about openings, guess who I'm going to think of who's going to be top of mind for me? So build relationships and nurture them. Don't wait for something that you need from them. So that's tip number two. There was another tip that came to my mind, but of course I went on my soapbox so now I can't remember um, okay. what it is. Oh, ask for informational interviews. Ooh, mm-hmm. A company may not be hiring right away, but if you're following certain people on LinkedIn within your industry and you're really interested in the company that they're working with, ask them if they'd be willing to do an in-person or a virtual chat even if it's just for 15 minutes, so that you can learn more about them and their career. People love to talk about themselves, right? Yes, they do. So giving them that opportunity, and it doesn't have to be the highest executive level, reach out to a manager, reach out to someone who's maybe five to 10 years ahead of you. People typically want to help other people. So it's a great way to nurture relationships. It's a great way to impress people. And more importantly, it's a great way to learn. So those would be three tips. Those are three great ones. Thank you. Yeah, it seems so simple, but it's just like the little things and we're our own worst enemy of thinking like, oh, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. It's like, just freaking do it. It's totally fine. Now, Michelle, as we wrap this up, what overall advice do you have for listeners? So I have a few different things. I would tell people to trust your gut. Listen to your own intuition because nobody knows better than you. So that's number one. Number two, don't be afraid to fail. You cannot get ahead without making mistakes. And as long as you're learning from every piece of your journey, you're moving forward. Um, this one is more personal. Be tolerant. Be tolerant of people who have different ideas and different opinions. I think we live in a society right now where we are so intolerant of anyone who thinks a little bit differently. So we need to get to a kinder place. And then I have a quote that I am going to borrow from. I got this off of a meditation. Confidence is your birthright. And I love those words. And I would tell you, everybody deserves to feel confident. So find your confidence, nurture your confidence and leverage it because it will get you to where you want to go. Confidence is your birthright. That's a great one. Put that on a T-shirt. I'll buy it. That's great. Ooh, maybe that'll be my second entrepreneurship. (laughs) Because you're not busy enough, right? (laughs) Michelle, you are dynamite. I am so blessed we got connected. I'm so excited to see what the future holds for both of us and potentially working together. Yeah. If you're listening to this, you want to check out what Michelle's doing, work with her, head to the show notes and tune in again next week for another episode of That's Business. If you're looking for a career change and you're not sure where to start, the Resume Rescue can help. Sure, there's no such thing as the perfect fit for everyone, but here at The Resume Rescue, we're on a mission to find the perfect solution for you. Whether it's changing careers, updating a resume, learning LinkedIn, or practicing interviewing, we have you covered. Find us online at theresumerescue.com and find all of our contact info in our show notes.